<laughs> Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, we are about to hear from our special guest, Erica Gallantin. Uh, but real quick before we get going, just want to welcome all of you tonight to the Tennessee Valley Wild Ones. Um, uh, we're having our monthly virtual meeting tonight, and maybe in the near future, we will move back to in-person meetings. Um, if you're new, uh, I'll just say that uh, Tennessee Valley Wild Ones is just a chapter of a national organization. Uh, we're maybe the second largest chapter in the country at this point, and we have a lot to offer, um, a lot of programs uh, besides this free educational programming that we do once a month. So there is also certificate in native plants courses, which are a little longer and more in depth, and they do cost uh, some money, but there's a discount for members. Um, so there is a uh, a certificate in native plants class coming up on July 10th. There may still be um, some open seats in that class. It is a summer tree ID class with our city forester. My coworker, uh, Pete Stewart, will be teaching that class, I believe. Um, there is also a members hike coming up um, this weekend. And there may be one slot available to that, so. <laughs> So jump on that. Uh, the Vesta Cedar Glade should be a really fantastic hike. I, I believe it's with Dennis Horn, who you, whose name you may recognize from one of our favorite field guides. Um, uh, Cullowee Native Plant Conference, if, if you've never been, is, is truly a delight. It's going to be virtual this year, uh, and it will be July 16th and 17th. Um, so check that out. Um, if you don't want to travel to North Carolina, you can participate virtually. So that's a different kind of opportunity this year. Uh, any other announcements? Um, I think Marty might make, <laughs> might repeat herself real quick. Uh, real we, quick. Have one uh, more program. we have one more program. Yeah, so that is for members only. And it's a trip to Hole in Wall, Tennessee, to a 55 acre uh, farm that has been converted into a nature preserve. And we've been invited along with the Middle Tennessee chapter to go up and spend the day. It's July 5th, starting at 9.30 uh, Central Time. Um, so we, it, it ought to be a great day, even though it's, you know, kind of an odd day on a Monday uh, and some distant for us, some distance for us. But if you're interested, reach out to tnvalleywildones.org, uh, email us. Uh, either that or the membership so that will be good great thanks so much yeah it, it would be really lovely to meet um some of our friends in nashville that's a that's a newer chapter in nashville so it'd be great to strengthen ties with them um any other uh, announcements okay well i'll just say real quick uh, we're gonna hold questions um, until Erica is ready to take questions. Um, so I, I'll be checking out the chat box. Uh, you can raise your hand also, but keep, keep muted just to keep the background noise down. And uh, we'll wait until there's question time to, to speak out loud, but you can type whatever you like in the chat box um, that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, any uh, any other questions? Anything else? All right. Well, I would just love to uh, to introduce you all to Erica Gallantin. She is a clinical herbalist consulting from Sovereignty Herbs, which is based in Athens and Columbus, Ohio. She holds a degree in herbal medicine from the University of Wales, Cardiff, in the UK and the Scottish School of Herbal Medicine in uh, Glasgow. Um, she's a professional member of the National Institute of Medical Herbalists in the UK and the American Herbalist Guild. Uh, she is also a proud member of the Phi Alpha Xi, <laughs> I never know how to pronounce Greek, uh, National Honor Society in Horticulture. And I'll add also that, uh, I first 
just got to hear Erica speak at the Cullowee Native Plant Conference maybe three or maybe four years ago at this point. I don't even remember. Um, and I was just so delighted to hear from an herbalist that could speak really fluently about native plants and um, shared that enthusiasm that, that this group shares. So, um, so yeah, join me in welcoming Erica. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoy hanging out with wild ones. Um, my favorite kind of folks to hang out with actually. <laughs> the wilder, the better, I say. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, and yes, I have a very deep love for the Cullowee Native Plant Conference. Um, for those of you who uh, haven't had the opportunity to go or attend, um, it's really pretty mind blowing. Um, and the people there are just incredible and super welcoming and always keep it um, definitely keep it entertaining as well. So um, definitely props to them. And yeah, I think what we'll do maybe is just wait to have questions until the end. Uh, hopefully there won't be like tons and tons of questions. Um, if you've got something that's absolutely pressing, uh, you know, definitely feel free to enter something into the chat box and that will be conveyed. Um, I'm also going to be doing a little bit of a, a quiz or a, um, you know, kind of a guess who. Uh, so feel free to uh, liberate your answers in the chat box for that as well. Uh, so yeah, so five uh, surprising medicinal stories of five native plants. It is always so difficult for me to choose uh, who to talk about in these talks because they're just are you know, this country and especially Appalachia is just so rich in uh, medicinal plant history. Uh, it's um, really quite incredible to sort through. And so I, I thought that I would kind of try to stick to plants that you all will probably be seeing around your area. Um, and, you know, kind of might be more familiar with um, based on this kind of epic biodiversity that is uh, Tennessee, uh, as well as Southeast Ohio. So there I am hiding behind a dandelion, uh, obviously not native, but uh, naturalized and a very important, uh, a very important plant in uh, modern day herbalism. Um, and what else was I going to say here? So Sovereignty Herbs uh, is, I am a co-creatrix, co-owner of Sovereignty Herbs, and we're actually based out of Southeast Ohio. So a lot of people think about Ohio being corn and soy, but uh, actually the Southern East, Southeastern side of the state is uh, actually incredibly, wonderfully biodiverse. It's where the glacier stopped and where the Appalachian Mountains start. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar um, with the area, we have um, Highlands Nature Sanctuary uh, right around uh, Serpent Mound in Adams County. Uh, there's just incredible biodiversity there as well. And uh, we have really great organizations uh, in the area doing uh, conservation work, including Rural Action, as well as a group called United Plant Savers. Uh, and they're a nonprofit that uh, is near and dear to my heart um, and specifically dedicated to supporting conservation of native medicinal uh, plants um, that have uh, become at risk due to habitat loss and over harvesting. So it's really quite a wonderful part of the country to live in um, and to be an herbalist in. So some of the things that uh, we offer at Sovereignty Herbs, obviously, uh, first and foremost, I do do herbs and wellness coaching. Um, and so uh, I take clients in from all over the country and I even have clients from further afield like Greece and Ecuador, kind of exciting. Um, so uh, for those of you interested in exploring how you know herbalism can support you, uh, we definitely have options for you there. We also offer beginner through advanced herbalism and aromatherapy programs and workshops. And luckily things are kind of starting to um, get back to where we can all gather in person. And so I'm really looking forward to hosting some uh, live classes, in-person classes as well. I really miss teaching like live in a classroom and gathering with people. Um, and then also quickly, we have an online shop um, and one of our kind of signature products is our native flower essence line. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with what flower essences are, there's a really wonderful um, explanation on our website. And these are all made from uh, flowers that are growing in my gardens. Um, I am a garden obsessive, I would say. Uh, and I mean that in the nicest way towards myself. Um, but native plant propagation in particular is a very fascinating 
um, aspect of my kind of life. And so I do spend a lot of time uh, collecting seed and learning how to propagate plants from seed um, and, you know, kind of populating my little corner of the world uh, with as many natives as I possibly can. Um, and I also do a lot of um, creation of aromatherapy products and distilling of aromatherapy products based on native plants. Uh, so for example, those of you who have ever crunched and smelled the spice bush um, will know that actually you can distill that into an essential oil and um, you can actually scent things with it. And so uh, a couple other of my favorites are mountain mint as a really nice one. Um, and uh, there's, there's, many, there's many to call on as far as native aromatic plants are concerned. So putting a different twist on aromatherapy. And before I get diving in too much into like the nitty gritty of, of herbs and medicinal plants and what they're used, uh, how they're used, um, I, you know, I always feel like it's important to provide some context as to where I kind of source my information from. Um, other than the fact that I've got over 15 years of clinical practice experience uh, working with all different kinds of plants, including ones native to North America, um, you know, there is a really rich and wonderful tradition of use uh, for a lot of native North American plants that, uh, you know, come to us from um, the indigenous people of this uh, country. And one of the things I want to say, you know, as a larger umbrella of all of this is that I, I do believe very firmly that there are many misunderstandings about what herbalism is and what it entails. And I think a lot of times we're taught to think about uh, you know, what we can use plants for. And so, you know, oh, that's, uh, you know, echinacea, you know, that treats this problem, or we can use it for that problem. And this is what I kind of refer to as your, your standard kind of pharmaceutical mentality, which is really dedicated um, specifically to, you know, the way that pharmaceuticals work in the human body. Herbs are very different. And so they're, they're not drugs, and they don't behave like drugs. They have a very different way of working with the physiology of the body to support, uh, you know, to support the body systems and their vitality and well-being. And so we're not treating problems with herbs. We're actually trying to support uh, kind of native vitality and health. And so when I go to talk about different herbs and how they're used this evening, you're going to notice that I'm not mentioning different things that you can use that herb for. I'm going to be talking with language um, surrounding things like support, um, maintaining vitality, uh, working with the body rather than against disease. And so this is a big, a big misunderstanding that's out there in mainstream, uh, especially mainstream America, about what herbalism entails. Um, I just quick caveat that there's terrible information available online. So you know, if you're Googling uh, you know, uses of medicinal plants, uh, you have to be very careful about what you read uh, because there's a lot of regurgitation of nonsense out there that um, I think can not only cause harm to people, but also can really end up causing harm to the plants because people just love uh, you know, getting that new exciting plant that they can go out and harvest like crazy. And then all of a sudden that plant population or that plant, that species in general becomes unnecessarily put under pressure. So, um, you know, I always say, uh, you know, check with herbalists like myself or herbalists local to Tennessee, ask them, you know, hey, where are your sources for information about medicinal plants? I really want to learn more. Um, and usually uh, folks like myself can send you in the right direction. Um, the other thing I want to say too, before we start diving into the, the fun stuff is that, um, you know, we have to be careful, I'm always careful, I'll just say, about um, really turning to what is referred to as the ethnographic record, uh, which is kind of, you know, uh, the kind of academic and I'll dare say colonial um, uh, recording of the use of medicinal plants by the indigenous people of this country. Um, and not to say that, you know, these sources of information is like, oh, you know, Native Americans in, is, is a huge, it's a huge thing to say anyway, but, you know, maybe this particular tribe used uh, plants in a particular way. And um, one of the problems with that is, uh, you know, that information has been filtered through the lens of colonialism and academia. And there's so much that can be lost in translation, misunderstanding, because it's not coming from, it's not coming from their language. It's not coming from their worldview. It's coming through the English language and the English worldview. And so we 
you know, we do end up missing out on the richness of Native American uses. And I think people kind of toss those about as fact um, in a really unsubstantiated way. And so I'm always cautious about, uh, you know, not really relying heavily on um, that information, especially if that information's coming to me third party through academia, which most of it is. And so I, when it comes to, you know, native plants of North America, I spend a lot of time uh, working with some of the texts that were published, many, 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 many books, uh, you know, during the late 19th century, early 20th century in uh, colonial America, uh, there was a time period of time that's often referred to as the American botanical movement, whereby, uh, you know, physicians of that era were rejected uh, what was considered orthodox medicine at the time, and really kind of turned their backs on uh, the cure that usually involved a bunch of bloodletting and things like mercury and uh, loads and loads and loads of opioids and um, these things that actually ended up making, you know, the cure would often kill the patient before, uh, you know, it would cure the patient. And so uh, there was a large period of time in our history and the history of medicine in the United States where uh, there were physicians turned their backs on these traditional treatments and, and looked to the plants again. And so they were prolific writers. And we have over a hundred years worth of really wonderful um, kind of almost clinical anecdotal information about um, what these physicians were experiencing using these different plants. Um, and to me, that's a very wonderful, rich historical source that's that is in English and it's not kind of filtered um, in, in any kind of way that would cause misunderstanding. And so, um, you know, that's really a very uh, a rich source of information that I will be presenting this evening. And I've got some quotes for you. Okay, so the way this is gonna work, we're gonna move into the plants now. I'm gonna start off, we've got five plants. And what I thought I would try to do is um, see if I could drop some clues and have uh, everyone um, see if they can guess who we're gonna talk about. Um, I just thought this would be a fun way of introducing their botany and, uh, and and whatnot. So um, as I go through these points, if you feel like you know who it is, or even if you don't really know for sure who it is, you can still make a guess in the chat box. And uh, I think Lynn will read, read those out to me before I reveal who we're talking about. So it's so a plant number one. So this is a perennial vine that likes to grow in the woodlands and in woodland edges. It has these really wonderful heart-shaped leaves with almost parallel venation and really smooth margins, like perfectly heart-shaped. It's dioecious, which means that the pistillate, which are the, the you know, traditionally referred to as female flowers and the staminate, which are traditionally referred to as male flowers are actually on separate plants. So in order to get that uh, producing of seed, you need both uh, you know, the pistillate and the staminate plants around. And then the last clue is that the common name often misleads folks to believe that it is related to an edible tuber. So I'm wondering if we have any guesses. Does anyone want to try to guess who we're talking about? Wait just a second more. We've got one guess right now. Anybody else? Uh, you can open up your chat box if you hover your cursor over at the bottom of your screen. If you haven't opened your chat box already. Any other guesses? We've got one guess uh, that it's passion flower. Another guess of pipe vine, wild yam. We got two for wild yam, bleeding heart, Dioscaria velosa. That might be a scientific name for the same. Uh, wild ginger, wild yam. Well, these all are right, all, a lot of guesses. These are right. all really wonderful, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful guesses indeed. And the, the true plant is wild yam, Dioscorea velosa. So congratulations to those of you who could pick it up. Um, and this is, a, this is a picture that's actually coming from my, my gardens here. When I moved to the property uh, that I live on now, which is bucked up into about a 3000 acre parcel of Wayne National Forest in Southeast Ohio. Um, our house was completely overgrown by the forest. 
Um, we had to slowly peel it back over time, but one of the beautiful things that were, was existing there was quite a uh, phenomenal population of uh, both, you know, pistillate and staminate um, yam plants. And so I have this fantastic population all over the place, and I can't wait to, to tell you more about propagating it. But this is wild yam, Dioscorea velosa is its uh, genus and species. And for right now, before the, uh, you know, botanists decide to change things on us, uh, it is in the Dioscoreaceae family, Dioscoreaceae family. Say that 10 times fast, my goodness. So wonderful plant. And this is here, uh, this is its kind of um, fresh out for the spring, kind of late May, where you've got this cascade of greens, it really just adds such a wonderful texture and color to uh, the garden. So this is in, uh, you know, in herbalism, this is what we call an antispasmodic, which is kind of what it says on the label. It helps reduce spasm. So, so antispasmodic is a term that we use to describe herbs that promote relaxation in smooth muscle tissue. So we have smooth muscle tissue basically lining all of the tubes in our body, right? So our gastrointestinal tract, uh, our reproductive tract, the urinary tract, our blood vessels, specifically uh, our, our arteries and capillaries. So uh, smooth muscle is really quite fantastic because its job is to pump, right? Um, and to contract and expand. Very different than skeletal muscle, which is what we use to move our skeletons around. So with this being an antispasmodic and promoting relaxation in the smooth muscle tissue, this particular species um, has specific affiliations for the intestines and the gallbladder ducts. Um, why does it have this uh, specific affiliation? Hard to say, but uh, hundred, hundreds of years worth of use has really kind of highlighted this. And in my clinical experience using wild yam, uh, it's a very, very effective uh, gastrointestinal antispasmodic. And this is what uh, some of the colonial physicians had to say about it. Its principal use has been in the various forms of wind and bilious colic. So this is when your gallbladder is spasming, usually as a result of uh, having gallstones or uh, you know, kind of uh, gallstone sludge or gravel, to which it is admirably adapted. It both relaxes the muscular fibers and soothes the nerves, aiding in the expulsion of flatches. So for those of you who can think about what that feels like um, and that, that relief that you get when the flashes is expelled, um, that's that kind of action that Dioscorea has in the guts. They go on to say that it is indeed an excellent agent and in all painful and flatulent troubles of the bowels, whether simple colic or connected with cold or diarrhea. For these purposes, it is generally advisable to combine it with some other agent more stimulating than itself such as ginger, angelica, or another aromatic. And so this is an herb that we tend to not use by itself. Um, this is an herb that's often used in conjunction with something that is a little bit more uh, stimulating or pungent. Um, and so the, some of the examples here, angelica root is one, uh, that's a very kind of um, aromatic, warming, um, stimulating herb or ginger. For those of you who are familiar with ginger, when I say aromatic and stimulating and warming, you know what I mean. So we often use the stimulating aromatic in conjunction with the wild yam to help promote uh, this kind of relaxation in um, and expansion really in, in the gastrointestinal tract. So it is the root that is used for those of you who want to know. And one of fun fact about it is that it is related to a Mexican species of Dioscorea that was the original source of uh, synthetic progestins. And, and this is a class of pharmaceutical hormones, uh, much like progesterone, um, and has really was the source uh, for what we now have as the modern birth control pill, as well as hormone replacement therapy. So um, one of the components in uh, the wild yam we have here in Appalachia um, is really uh, kind of a relative of this. It's not necessarily uh, as hormone supporting as this Mexican species, but uh, just a little bit, a bit of interesting history about that plant genus. I will say though, um, this is a species that is considered at risk by United Plant Savers. That's that nonprofit I mentioned that's into uh, supporting medicinal plant conservation. 
Um, and, and much like ginseng and golden seal, you know, we've had issues with, uh, you know, habitat loss and over harvesting. And that, that's kind of the wild storm that creates, um, you know, loss of, of the species. So um, it definitely is not something that's used uh, heavily. Uh, we have other um, agents, I would say, that are um, more sustainable uh, and uh, e more easy to grow and more, more accessible, e more easily cultivatable, et cetera. So uh, we only go I only turn to wild yam uh, when I feel like it's absolutely the only plant that's really going to do the job. So um, I will say, though, it is incredibly easy to propagate via root cuttings. Um, and one of the things that I, I did while I, you know, after I moved into my, my home in the hollow there, you know, I broke off these, uh, you know, I, the, the rhizomes just ride right underneath the soil surface. And you can actually just, uh, well, you can't really break off. You have to use a saw for something incredibly sharp because it's very tough. Um, but you can take those small pieces from the end of the rhizome and you can plant them in different places and, uh, you know, a whole new, a whole new experience happens. And so I have currently from that one large wild yam population, I now have wild yam populations growing all over my house, uh, growing all over teepees that I've got in different places. It's really quite exciting. And so here's a really cheesy picture of one of those. Um, that's my face there. And that's uh, about 13 feet tall. Uh, wild yam, uh, what I call the wild yam TP behind the house. Okay, so plant number two, get your, get your thinking caps on folks. Okay, here we go. So this is a perennial woody deciduous shrub, which also likes to grow in woodland edges. You often see it hanging onto rocky outcroppings, ravines and stream banks. And it gets to be about three to six feet tall. So not huge. It has opposite leaves that grow from previous year's woody growth. It has tiny white sterile flowers that bloom around May through July in these kind of flattened hairy looking clusters, also known as corms, uh, that are anywhere between two and six inches across. Um, scattered uh, continuing flowering may occur throughout the summer into September and occasionally on these corms you get a few larger sterile flowers uh, that appear kind of in the margins, which are a little bit bigger, a little bit showier, um, but sterile. It has also, this particular species has also been transformed into many horticultural cultivars. Uh, most of which have been selected for these larger sterile flowers that end up making a big ball-shaped bloom. So do we have any guesses as to who I might be talking about? We do, we've got some guesses. Uh, smooth hydrangea, native hydrangea, elderberry, hydrangea arborescens, uh, cephalanthus. That's Interesting guess. Uh, Itea was something I was going to throw in there. Another wild hydrangea, hydrangea, hydrangea. <laughs> you all don't skip a beat. You are right. It is wild hydrangea, uh, right. also known as smooth hydrangea. And um, you know, one of the most amazing things I discovered uh, a couple of years ago when I was uh, getting really up close and personal with my macro lens. <laughs> Uh, was that um, our hydrangeas that I now have, I've selected for them in the, on the property, right? So we, we've cleared away all the stuff and we've just let them grow out and get a little bit more exposed to the light. And they're just prolific now and just so beautiful, especially this time of year. The flowers themselves, the flower heads are just so delicious. The smell is just, you can just get lost in this wonderful aroma that's not like anything else I can explain. It's it's sweet uh, and it's kind, and it has just this lovely aroma. And the, the pollinators that are just go crazy over this plant. So my husband and I have honeybees. Um, and so of course the honeybees love it. Um, but one of the things that I found really fascinating was the relationship that this plant has with ants. And I, it makes me think about how, even though we don't like them in our kitchens, uh, how important ants are to native plant ecology and especially in our woodland areas. They are just, you know, as they're diving around looking for sweet nectar or farming their aphids and doing their interesting things, um, they really are promoting an enormous amount of uh, biodiversity. And so you know, just yay for ants. 
so anyway, wild hydrangea, hydrangea aborescence, uh, for now is in the hydrangeaceae family. Uh, and again, these uh, you know, molecular biologists are really shifting things around on us very quickly. Uh, but for now, I feel pretty confident that that's its, uh, its genus, species, and family. So I always like to say about wild hydrangea or smooth hydrangea is that it grow, how it grows is what it knows. Um, and this is just kind of my funny way of remembering the plant, I suppose. Um, so colonial physicians used the root of this species as what we call an antilithic in the urinary system. And for those of you who are familiar with uh, Latin, the lithic refers to stone, right? So this is uh, looking at uh, using the root uh, when there were you know, kidney stones or bladder stones present in the urinary system. So they write, as a remedy for the removal of calculus or gravelly deposits in the bladder, and for relieving the excruciating pain of passing calculus through the ureter. It is only, while the deposits are small, when that form of the disease known as gravel, that it is an efficient remedy. Thus, it is chiefly an, eliminat it is chiefly an eliminatory action rather than any, having any power to dissolve the gravel itself. So I paraphrased that and I think that I typed it out poorly, but what this is saying to us from this kind of colonial perspective and the use of the root of this medicine is that it wasn't necessarily something that they would use to dissolve gravel, but it was really more about promoting the elimination, uh, you know, elimination of these deposits or this buildup of material within the urinary system. And uh, as we uh, probably, some of us know, the urinary system is a very important eliminatory system in the body. All of our blood gets filtered uh, and sent via the lymphatic system to our urinary system. And so anything that's not supposed to be in our blood is, is excreted that way. And so because it's really channeling uh, elimination or wastes out of the body, we can find just like the digestive system and, and other systems of elimination, they can get clogged up, uh, especially if, um, you know, what's going into the body uh, itself is, uh, you know, uh, more toxic, if you will, or, or has with it lots of problems. Um, and I think in, in modern America, really, uh, we're looking at things like refined uh, sugars and, uh, you know, hydrogenated fats and some of these, um, you know, kind of more industrialized uh, substances that are used to uh, flavor foods, which can cause a lot of problems for people who are sensitive. And so, you know, we translate this into kind of modern herbalism practice. And this is something that we refer to as a, a urinary alternative. An alternative is a, an herb that has the ability to support the eliminatory processes of a particular body system. So we have urinary alternatives, we have respiratory alternative alternatives, we have di you know digestive alternatives. Um, and their, their job really is to help make that elimination process more efficient, um, especially when we're inputting with other things like a better diet and uh, more water, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we definitely see this, uh, I definitely see this herb. I don't use it a ton, but it definitely comes up when uh, I'm working with people to promote urinary health, especially when there's a tendency towards, like a constitutional tendency towards infection or what I call to what I call holding on to rocks, and so <laughs> to me, I just think it's fascinating how we have this this wonderful shrub that really does hold on to rocks. It really find it loves this territory where you have these uh, these outcroppings and these ravines on these edges, and it's uh, it's kind of jagged territory. It's where I tend to see it the most, um, and so you know I I see there a, a, a very interestingly. Uh, enjoyable uh, metaphor, I guess, if you will, between uh, how the plant grows. It grows, it, it grows, how it grows is what it knows, you know. Um, so it has this kind of action on, on for folks who are holding on to rocks in their urinary, urinary system. Um, and we also use this, I also use this clinically uh, in times where we have um, 
for lack of a better way of putting it, kind of just a bogginess in the bladder and also in the prostate gland. This is often comes across in uh, situations like, uh, you know, interstitial cystitis, chronic urinary tract infections, uh, and then of course, benign prostate hyperplasia, where you have this kind of bogginess and swelling of the prostate gland. Um, and so it definitely is called upon uh, in, in modern herbalism to kind of help restore tone uh, and, to, and to move um, all of that accumulation out of the body. It is quite strong um, and is only used in very small amounts. So this is not something that, um, you know, I would suggest people kind of go out looking for. Um, and I will say too that, you know, it, it is the root that's used. And so we have to consider that when we, you know, when we dig up the plant and use the root, we kill the plant. And uh, sometimes we can find um, alternatives that don't require uh, that type of uh, destruction. Sometimes we can't. Sometimes all there is is hydrangea and that's what we're going to have to use. Um, I will say one of the things that I've experienced with this and actually quite a few other um, kind of you know, traditionally woodland medicinals is that as long as there's really good moisture available, um, a lot of these species and hydrangea uh, aborescence included really does well if it has a little bit more sun. Um, I've definitely seen it growing in full shade, kind of understory, lurking in the shadows, um, and it, it can do just fine there. Uh, and similarly, I've seen it growing in, in kind of dry, full sun where it, it just does, it does terribly. Um, but if we can find this middle ground with, you know, you know, four, four and six hours of really juicy sun and nice kind of mesic soils, um, you get this blooming uh, that is just, it's just wonderful, just wonderful. So same with the wild yam, you know, if, if you don't be afraid to kind of bring it out into the light a little bit and see what it can do. I did mention this, that it does have a wonderful fragrance. I couldn't help myself. I had to spill the beans on that right away. Um, and of course it is a, a native pollinator heaven. So uh, I hope you all enjoy your hydrangeas. Okay, let's see what time is it? Oh, we're doing great. So plant number three, plant number three, we're gonna get our thinking caps back on. This is gonna be a little bit more of a tricky one. I didn't give you really great clues on this one, but we'll see what happens. So this is an herbaceous perennial, also growing in woodland edges and reaching about two to three feet tall. So an herbaceous perennial. It has sessile opposite leaves. So this is, these are leaves that don't uh, have a, a, a petiole. They're really just, they look like they're just directly connected to the stalk. And these leaves grow out opposite of each other up the stem. And they have really smooth margins that when you hold them up to the light, have these really visible reddish purple glands that line the edge of the leaf. And if you also holding it up to the light, look through the leaf, it has all of these translucent dots all throughout the leaf. Um, and actually this is where the species gets both its species and common name. The, fl the flowers of this plant are, are really small. They're yellow. They don't have any fragrance to them. And they've got five petals and they tend to appear around the summer solstice as well as uh, the date of a celebration of a certain Catholic saint that is the origin of its common name as well. And these, uh, these petals also have kind of reddish purple dots or glands that you can see uh, when you're looking closely. So any, any thoughts about what this one might be? Yeah, let's see here. We got a few ideas. St. John's wort, also known as Hypericum. St. John's wort, St. John's wort. That's kind of what I was thinking too. <laughs> Yeah, Although you, I don't know if I've ever actually looked through the leaves. Oh, yeah. Yes, it's a wonderful thing to do. And you're all very right. I'm so glad to see you. you're so clever. It <laughs> is. This is a spotted St. John's wort in particular, Hypericum punctatum. And uh, I love this image here. The, these are all photographs that I, I've taken myself, FYI. But you can actually see even on the flower buds, all of those little streaks, purple streaks. 
and spots and along the along the like the margin of the leaf as well uh, you have these dark purple reddish uh, glands and uh, if you look then of course in between um, you know the veination pattern you see all of these there's some water on these leaves here too but if you look closely you can see these little dots that have uh, punctuated the leaf that's where it gets its punctatum name but what's fascinating about these uh, these reddish purple uh, spots and streaks is that this is where um, a lot of the, uh, the the plant's medicinal properties uh, lie. We actually find, in particular, with uh, this particular species as well as its European cousin, um, that some of the main chemical compounds that have been focused on in scientific research are actually in these reddish purple glands and uh, what is secreted by them. So when, when you take something like spotted St. John's wort and you roll it between your fingers really uh, roughly and kind of just tear the, the plant tissue up in between your fingers, I know it sounds very violent, um, but if you, if you do that with a leaf, uh, you will notice that your fingers get stained a little bit purple. And that's, um, that is actually a big part of where the, the medicinal qualities of the plant come from. Really, really fascinating. So by and large, uh, St. John's wort is, oh gosh, you know, I just feel bad for this particular, uh, you know, for this plant, but definitely for its European uh, cousin. It just got pigeonholed. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but it's just, it's so much more than what people give it credit for. And in many ways, um, I, the way that we describe it as uh, herbalists is using this word nervine, nervine. And this is a wonderful word um, because this word describes an action of a medicinal plant that is not available in pharmaceutical medicine. Nervine is a term that is used by herbalists to describe herbs which promote relaxation in the nervous system. And this idea of relaxation is very different than sedative, right? So when we sedate something, we slow its function down. Sedation is about slowing things down. But the nervine action is about relaxing things. And so we have a particular class of plants here that are able to promote relaxation uh, in the nervous system. And then of course, in, in multiple aspects of the body without creating this sedative or sleepy effect. And it's a really, I mean, we have so many uh, 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 herbs that are native to North America that are in this category. Another one that is one of my favorites is skullcap, the mad dog skullcap, uh, the Scutellaria lateriflora. Um, this is also considered kind of a really uh, wonderful nervine. And oftentimes in my clinical practice, I'm using the punctatum, hypericum punctatum and the scutellaria together in tandem. They make a really great team. So, you know, a lot of where we get our information about the use of uh, the native hypericum, the hypericum punctatum, and I, I do appreciate there's lots of different native hypericums. So the one that I'm speaking about here in particular is punctatum. Um, there are a variety of hypericums in North America, which do not have, at least to our knowledge at the moment, uh, similar medicinal qualities. So we'll just keep it to punctatum for now. But it's, it's European St. John's word, this uh, hypericum perforatum, uh, has been used for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years as a nervous system tonic. In fact, it was one of the, one of the main plants that was brought over uh, during the colonial period uh, from Europe because people just could not live without it. And one of the sad parts of the St. John's wort story is that, you know, the, particularly the American dietary supplement industry, which I think can be as rapacious as the pharmaceutical industry sometimes, you know, that one of the drivers is making money, right? So how do we do that? We create a product that seems to, you know, touch on things that people need and provide some sort of solution. So because of this, they, they shoved St. John's wort into this uh, category of being an antidepressant. Um, and, and generally now you see it being sold over the counter, uh, even sometimes suggested by physicians for mild to moderate depression. And this is where, you know, I said at the beginning of my presentation, how I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about herbalism and how herbs work. When we talk about St. John's wort treating depression, it's not really the case. 
right? What, what St. John's work can do is it can really help promote this relaxation in the nervous system, which then leads to an elevation of mood um, for a variety of reasons. And so uh, from an herbalist perspective, it's, it's a very different type of, um, and it has such expansive possibilities uh, when we don't try to shove it into a box and say it's an antidepressant only. So um, it's just kind of an interesting way of thinking about things kind of differently. How does St. John's wort promote wellness in the body? It does that by promoting relaxation in the nervous system. And it has a particular affiliation for the digestive system uh, where we have uh, what we call our, our gut brain. It's like our second brain. 90% uh, of our neurotransmitters are actually manufactured in the gut by uh, our intestinal microbiome. And so the St. John's Ward itself, including punctatum here, uh, has a, is, is kind of a really wonderful gut brain herb, uh, if we can call, if we want to try to put it in that box. I'd prefer that box over antidepressant. Um, so one of the other things about St. John's Ward, and in particular, uh, its European relative, is that it is uh, what I often call the poster child for herb drug interactions. And uh, there's a lot, there's a huge fascinating story uh, about how they, they came to discover this. But by and large, basically what St. John's wort does when taken at the same exact time, so the, the herb has to be in the small intestine at the same time as the drug. And if it is, it is able to, it speeds up the body's metabolism so efficiently that it clears that drug out of the system uh, and therefore too, too quickly. And therefore the drug is never able to reach its kind of uh, therapeutic dose. Um, and so this can be very problematic, uh, especially for people who are on really sensitive pharmaceuticals. And so oftentimes there's a lot of fear surrounding using St. John's wort, even though it's such a wonderful herb, um, but when used, uh, you know, when used cognitively, when used, um, you know, from an educated place, uh, you know, there's very limited problems using it, but it is, it is the poster child for herb drug interactions. And it says, Hey, this can happen. So um, I think it's got, it's a fascinating story. Um, I have a professor from the University of Wales who used to talk to me about St. We used to talk, well, not to me, but to class about St. John's Wort as the sunshine herb. And I just thought I'd put that in here uh, simply because, again, it just felt better than calling it antidepressant. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are familiar uh, with Jim Duke's work, the late Jim Duke, he passed away recently. Um, he did a, a ton of medicinal plant research for the FDA over decades and decades and decades, both here uh, in the United States and abroad. And he's got a wonderful uh, phytochemical database, which um, is kind of dedicated to looking at the, um, what we know of the constituent profiles of different medicinal plants, chemical profiles and whatnot. And he really believed that Hypericum punctatum was to be of equal value to its European species. And because of this, it's because of this information in my own research that I decided to bring it into my clinical practice about six or seven years ago. Um, and I have to say that, you know, anecdotally speaking, um, I do believe that it has really wonderful qualities to it. The other thing that people don't know about St. John's wort and punctatum, uh, the species punctatum is uh, included in this is that it is an incredible, uh, you know, it's an incredible plant to help promote uh, and support the healing of the skin. Uh, this is traditionally what people call uh, a wound herb. And um, it's, it's often used for, uh, you know, issues surrounding, um, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, people for people who get kind of cold sores and things like that, or any kind of skin that needs support in its granulation process. Um, it's also been used, uh, you know, for bruising and to help kind of, uh, you know, get, get the bruising healed up. So there's this whole external use of, of the plant as well, which is just really wonderful and, and very useful, um, but has also been kind of clouded by this pigeonhole of being an antidepressant. Okay, plant number four. Gosh, I hope I have enough time to get through everybody. Okay, so plant number four, here we go. Uh, I think some of you guys are all gonna know what this is. This is not hard for you at all. So this is an herbaceous perennial vine growing in full sun and park shade environments. So we're, going, we're back to the vines. It has alternate singular leaves with three pointed lobes and slightly toothed margins. 
It has what I call wonderfully spiralizing tendrils that grasp onto other structures to grow up them. The flowers are born from the axles of the leaves. They are incredibly complex in their architecture and fascinatingly beautiful. They are often visited by carpenter bees who seem to get quite in intoxicated by the nectar. And the fruit is edible, but is often misunderstood to have the same sweetness and fleshiness of its tropical relative. And unfortunately, it just doesn't. So what do you all think that this is? We have a lot of votes for Passiflora incarnata. Oh, flower vine. yeah, you got it. <laughs> and there it is, passion flower, Passiflora ACE. Um, I have to say that, I mean, we are just so blessed to have this plant, uh, you know, native to this area. It is just, it's a glorious, it's a glorious plant in the landscape, albeit it can be, uh, you know, for those of you who like to keep a tidy garden, it can be a little bit, uh, what's the word, um, overzealous, but um, my goodness gracious, I have had the funnest experiences watching these carpenter bees get absolutely intoxicated, where it's almost as if too, they, they fit perfectly into the structure here. They fit perfectly under the stamens, they hang out, it's like they're, they're at the bar and they're just having like lots and lots of good beer. And they just drink at this bar for hours and hours and hours until they basically fall asleep. And they are so passed out that you can literally knock them off the flower and they'll hit the ground and go, oh, whoa, should probably wake up now. And then they try to fly around and uh, they, they definitely are, um, they, they're in an altered state of consciousness it, as far as my observation is concerned. And it's really just quite hilarious. Uh, it's almost like the two of these species were, were made for one another, especially when you see the way that they fit in underneath the structure. So, um, and I have to say that I have recently uh, also, um, I managed to get my hands on some Passiflora lutea from one of my favorite native plant nurseries out of Floyd, Virginia, uh, wood thrush natives, um, because I've been, I had never ever seen the, the lutea flower before. So this was, uh, last year was the first year that I, it actually is growing on top of a wild yam. Um, they grow together and uh, I got to see the flowers. Um, and I think, you know, it's a less, it's a less robust species, but it has been used traditionally in the same way as, uh, as this species here, which is incredibly robust. Uh, and when it's happy, oh boy, is it happy. So this is what we refer to as a gentle sedative. So I talked to you in the last slide about the difference between uh, an herb that is thought to be relaxing, uh, where we, ha we have a relaxation effect that's not sleepy, that's not about slowing down function. Uh, but when it comes to passion flower, this is a, it has both a relaxing effect, but it is also considered a very gentle sedative. So it does have this slowing of function. And um, I really liked this quote, so I thought that I'd share this with you because it really sums it up well. It is especially useful to allay restlessness and overcome wakefulness when these are the result of exhaustion. It proves especially useful in the insomnia of infants and old people. It gives sleep to those who are laboring under the effects of mental worry or from mental overwork. And that was written in 1898. Um, and I will say that, you know, it is the leaves and flowers that are used. Um, and every year, because I have such a fantastic population that grows, uh, you know, at my place, um, you know, I'm able to create uh, several gallons of tincture a year. And between 2020, the beginning of 2020, and now, uh, I have gone through about six gallons of tincture of this particular herb. Um, so many clients coming to me uh, specifically with this um, you know, uh, insomnia due to laboring under the effects of mental worry uh, and mental overwork. It has been, uh, it has been this, a big superhero, uh, unspoken superhero of the last uh, year and a half. So um, what this does say is, uh, and one of the things I like to say about passion flower, especially using it as a tea, um, it's really good for squirrel brain when you're falling asleep. So um, you know, for, uh, the other way of saying it is like you're, you're totally wired, but exhausted. So the wired and tired, but you just can't fall asleep. 
Um, and the squirrel brain is when you're, you're lying there and you think, oh gosh, I'm so exhausted. I just totally can pass out. And then all of a sudden something happens where your, your brain is just going in circles and circles and circles and it won't stop. Um, and so, you know, this is where something like passion flower works so gently and so wonderfully uh, and without hangover uh, and out, you know, without issue uh, surrounding addiction, because this is also an issue for a lot of people uh, becoming addicted to the things that uh, they use to be able to sleep. So um, it makes a really wonderful tea and it is wonderfully safe. It is such a safe herb. It's safe for children and it's safe for the elderly. Um, I've used uh, passion flower leaf, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, to help support children, you know, even around the age of five or six, um, getting them to drink the tea is a totally different story, but I've got some tricks there too. Um, but, you know, especially over this last year and a half, uh, you know, both the very young and the very old egg, the anxiety levels and the lack of being able to rest just to turn off and rest has been a major problem uh, for a lot of people. And so uh, passion flower has really definitely come to the rescue. Okay, last one, last one. All right, one last plant. Let's see what you guys think. So this is an herbaceous perennial native to prairies and full sun locations with other native prairie plants. And is often found also on roadsides and in waste places. It is a nectar and host plant for numerous species of beetles and butterflies, including the monarch. And that's where it gets one of its common names. And the giveaway are the bright orange flowers that grow in dense clusters, unmatched in color by other native flowering species. Does anyone have a guess as to what I'm talking about? We've got someone in all caps saying milkweed <laughs> and uh, we've had a few other guesses someone said daylily which is unfortunately not a native uh, asclepius tuberosa is the scientific name for for milkweed for butterfly weed butterfly weed butterfly weed lots of guesses for butterfly weed excellent excellent you are a clever group of folks and you are right <laughs> it is butterfly weed. And it's really interesting because in the horticultural and native plant community, this is a species that its common name is butterfly weed. But in the herbalism community, we refer to it as pleurisy root. Uh, so it is Asclepius tuberosa. And I believe that's in the Aposinaceae family now. Uh, they did move it. Um, and I just, I have to say that I, I don't think that there is another color orange that quite hits the soul like this color does, um, especially when you get up close like this. And, uh, you know, you can really see these like dense, almost waxy looking flowers. Um, it's just right out of Alice in Wonderland or, you know, some kind of fantastical, I don't know, wonderful sci-fi film, or I don't know that to me, these, I just get lost in this color and it does, uh, it does do something to my, my spirit. It's very uplifting. It's a very uplifting color. Uh, so one of my favorite plants to, uh, to observe and to grow. So, and this is what we refer to as a respiratory tonic. This is a tr very traditional respiratory tonic. And it is the root that is traditionally used. So again, you know, we run into this problem of you, you know, harvest the root, you kill the plant. Uh, is there something else we could use instead that's an aerial portion of the plant that may not, you know, uh, cause the demise of that particular uh, specimen? Uh, but, you know, for the case of, of uh, you know, butterfly weed or pleurisy root, uh, it is only the root that's usable. Uh, we can't use the aerial parts, unfortunately, they're too toxic. But the, the root itself is really very, it's used in very specific ways. And so this is an herb that has very specific indications in herbal clinical practice um, that don't come up all that often. But I will say that in the last year and a half, uh, you know, since the pandemic began um, and working with a lot of people who have kind of chronic respiratory, um, you know, uh, discomforts, um, uh, you know, going on after COVID infection. This is a particular, this plant has come up uh, for in, in my clinical practice to be used a lot more than it really has in the past. So it really is another kind of unspoken superhero uh, in my clinic over the last year and a half. 
So, oh, I forgot to put the, who, who said this, but this is also William Cook, uh, 1869. He says, pleurisy root has a deservedly good reputation in respiratory diseases. And these are physicians now talking in the, in the 19th century. It acts upon the mucous membranes of the pulmonary tract, augmenting secretions and favoring easy expectoration. And so this kind of information is critically important to an herbalist like myself, when, uh, especially when we are working with people who are dealing with a lot of, you know, congestion in the lungs itself. And just like the, the common name pleurisy root states, there's a long tradition of use, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, herbalism, so to speak, in the United States, stemming back even into uh, what is believed to be uh, various Native American traditions uh, for using this herb to help move fluids out of the lungs um, and to help relieve tension and irritation in the lung tissue itself. And so, um, you know, you can think about people who have, have experienced kind of really heavy chestness. Um, it's often an herb that I uh, use to support respiratory health after uh, infections like pneumonia as well, uh, where there's just this leftover GAC, <laughs> the official word, uh, that sits heavy in the chest and, and, the, and the, the body's having difficulty moving that out. So it really helps promote healthy expectoration and also helps promote uh, a much more kind of a higher quality of mucus secretions from the bronchioles themselves. So we end up with a nice kind of healthy excretions lead to healthy expectoration, which leads to uh, respiratory, just kind of nice respiratory tonic action. Um, and so the other thing about it too, is that it has this, I spoke about antispasmodics when I talked about uh, wild yam. So this is that antispasmodic relaxing uh, in the smooth muscles of the bronchioles, which uh, you know sometimes can get very tense, especially uh, in cases like asthma, or um, you know if you're dealing with things like chronic bronchitis, where there's a lot of tension, a lot of spasm, even in the rib cage, even in those intercostal muscles. Uh, I can help really promote relaxation in that whole, in the whole breathe, like the mechanical breathing apparatus. Um, so this is a strong herb. Um, it's not toxic, but it's strong. So it's only needed in very small doses. And again, this is the root and it's prepared in a very specific way that, you know, kind of captures, um, you know, it, it captures the, the less non-toxic parts of the plant to make it a safe preparation. And it's often, it's never really used alone, uh, just like all herbs. Um, they, it, you know, herbs are usually kind of used together in teams. And I always, when I'm formulating for clients, I'm always creating what I call, uh, it's kind of like a play where you have a couple of lead actors and then you have supporting cast members and they all work together in that blend uh, to help support, you know, whatever it is you're trying to achieve. So, um, so it usually works with other respiratory tonics and a um, couple that are native uh, that are sometimes interesting to try out are like Menarda fistulosa. Uh, so that's the wild bergamo. Um, and occasionally for short periods of time, uh, any of the, um, the mountain mints uh, are also uh, for short-term use are really uh, you know, quite, uh, quite invigorating to the lungs and to the respiratory system. So uh, that's all I have for this evening. I just wanted to uh, drop a, a little, uh, you know, here, this is how you can find me online uh, slide. So uh, you can find Sovereignty Herbs on Facebook and Instagram uh, at Sovereignty Herbs is the handle for both of those. And our website is just sovereigntyherbs.com. Um, and you can also find my personal work. Um, I, you know, I try to attend to it as much as possible um, at The Medicine Gardener on Facebook, Instagram. And I also have kind of a brand new YouTube channel where I do a lot of kind of plant walks and garden talks and things like that. Really, it's just me like geeking out and on really cool plants that I've got growing around my medicine garden. So you can find me uh, on any of those platforms at The Medicine Gardener. And yeah, that's all I have for today. I'll open the floor up to any kind of questions. Erica, thank you so much. This is this has just been lovely, and I definitely want to check out your YouTube channel. It sounds great. <laughs> um, yeah, if uh, if folks have questions, it's it's past seven, but we'd we'd love uh, Erica if you've got a little more time. We'd we'd love to hang around a minute um, and chat if anybody has questions. Um, about the presentation.
I just loved your quizzes. That was really fun. I oh, feel like, good. Yeah, I feel like I'm so used to identifying things in the field, but not actually thinking about the the characteristics uh, and just breaking it down without without a visual image. That was that was actually challenging. Yeah. Well, you all did so well. My goodness. <laughs> I mean, and I didn't, you know, you never know. I mean, I could have gotten very botanical, but I thought, oh, let's have some fun. And I think, you know, sometimes we can get caught into plants as things and not necessarily, you know, necessarily as like characters in the landscape. They have their own, they have their own being and their own lifestyles and their own wants and needs. And um, I think sometimes it's always lovely to try to capture them more in story than in technical fact. Uh, so I thought I'd, I'd play on that a little bit. That's lovely. Um, so we've got uh, a question. What is the uh, benefit of ants in the garden? Oh, this is great. Well, so um, of course there's an entire, uh, there's an entire field of study into this particular phenomenon, but, and there's so many different species of ants and I think they all have different roles in some way, but some of the main roles that I've definitely witnessed in uh, my gardens uh, one is pollination. Uh, and so we do have kind of ant pollination mechanisms at play. Uh, the hydrangea aborescence is a really great example of that. Um, and then one of the other major um, aspects of ants in the gardens is seed dispersal. And so especially those, um, you know, the, the, like the woodland medicinals that are, are you know, the, the slow growing, slow to reproduce, um, uh, woodland medicinals like trilliums and bloodroot, their seeds have this little fatty deposit on them called an ileosome that the ants are just like totally crazy about. This is high density energy source. And so what they do is they go to the, 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 you know, the seed pod and they, they harvest these seeds with these fatty deposits on them and they drag them back to their, their you know, home turf. They rip off the fatty piece and carry that in and they discard the seed. And the, and the seed is discarded then in an environment where the soil has been uh, really wonderfully aerated and there's all different kinds of um, just wonderful ecology available for that seed to settle in and then to germinate. And so in my gardens, um, I have several species of trilliums uh, and the bloodroot has just gone has just gone bonkers because they, uh, I've got bloodroot in most unusual places now, but, and I know it's because of the ants. Uh, so they are definitely wonderful seed dispersers as well. Yeah, definitely. It's, I mean, there's, there's so much going on just right under our noses. It's, it's fun to think about. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we've got another question. Um, where can I find wild yams? Oh, this is I, a, yeah. That might be a local nursery question. I don't know if reflection writing our, our local native plant nursery. So well, I, yeah. And I think there's another one out of Nashville. Um, the, the barns, they own uh, grow wild out of mm -hmm. Nashville as well. Um, I also know that there's a few businesses that do mail order. Um, one is uh, with Rush natives out of Floyd, Virginia. And um, he's always at the Color Weep Native Plant Conference. So also, by the way, everyone just needs to go. When we do in-person Native Plant Conferences again, you just need to go to the Native Plant Conference and hope that they've got plants there for you to buy. You'll yeah. find yeah, you'll find wild yam there. Um, yeah, and and I, uh, will, I will add also, there is an, a very invasive Diascaria. Oh yes, batatas. That, Don't mm -hmm. do it. <laughs> yeah, so watch out for that if you uh, if anybody. If you think you have the native one, I, I hope you do, <laughs> but yeah. there is a chance that it's the invasive one. Um, yeah, so I would, I that. would suggest sticking to a native plant, like a, you know, a nursery that focuses on native plants um, specifically. Another one of my favorites is Prairie Moon Nursery. They're out of North Carolina as well. Um, they always have, uh, they have a wonderful selection of plants and their mail order. Um, I, I'm not sure about your Tennessee folks there, but um Try to yeah. get it from a native plant grower. That way you're sure it's not the patatas, which is crazy. It's a crazy plant. Absolutely, yeah. So I'd just add another nursery nearby would be Overhill Nursery. Check with them. Um, well, so on the topic of bloodroot, uh, someone's asking what, what the medicinal benefits of bloodroot might be. Yeah, really wonderful question. So 
a uh, quick story. I won't go too long. Uh, when I was first, uh, when I went to university, you know, we had, uh, it was a four-year medical degree program. We had to ingest every single herb that we studied. Um, mm. It was part of the process of learning that. And bloodroot is one of those plants that has got international recognition now. And so has crept its way into uh, what we call the materia medica of herbalists in the United Kingdom. So uh, we were specifically, uh, you know, going through what's called a tea tasting with that plant. And I remember it was first thing in the morning, I just got into class. I hadn't eaten anything that I'd yet. It was like I had been running late. And so uh, the first herb that we tasted of the day uh, in a tea form from the dried root was blood root. And I took two sips and then vomited all over my desk. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and what was interesting about this experience was that it forever made me understand the <laughs> potency of the plant, but also its therapeutic actions, which were really surrounding, traditionally surrounding its, uh, you know, if when we have a really powerful emetic like that, something that just makes you barf, it also usually has really profound expectorant qualities. So, uh, you know, we're dealing with really intense congestion in the chest. And so um, I haven't ever used bloodroot uh, in large quantities. It's a, it's a really caustic herb. You have to use very small amounts, um, but I have used it in, uh, uh, you know, very, very tough cases um, where, you know, my clients are suffering from cystic fibrosis. That's one of the major ones. And also like really wet asthma uh, where the lungs are just so bogged down um, that you just need a little bit of that blood root and it can, it can really force that expectoration process and help move some of that crud out. Um, but again, it's not an herb that you want to use yourself. It's definitely something that you would want to use under the guidance of someone that has some experience with it because it is really caustic. And, that, and it's interesting too, because a lot of people have you know, they've fallen into the whole idea of the, the black salve that you make with blood root that you can put on skin cancers and it, or tumors and it makes your tumors fall off and all of this other stuff. And, uh, you know, oftentimes the, the, these black salves that you get that are supposed to be blood root are really actually a form of zinc that's very caustic to the skin and, and things like that. And, the, and then the last story I'll say is that the dietary supplement industry, uh, we got very fascinated with uh, some of the kind of external or skin-like traditional uses of blood root. And they decided that they wanted to try to put it into toothpaste uh, mm -hmm. to help the promotion of healing gums. And what they discovered after about a year and a half or so of it being in all different kinds of natural toothpaste in the market, uh, that people were starting to get mouth sores from it. Uh, so they quickly pulled that as a, an acceptable ingredient in toothpaste. So... <laughs> Uh, so it, it does have medicinal virtues, but, um, you know, it's, it's one of those plants that you, you just don't need to go there unless you absolutely have to, um, and best to do that under the guidance of someone who has some experience. Gotcha. Yeah. I feel like knowing, knowing what these plants, um, can, can do in your body and just adds so much to, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I almost want to say like the personality like uh when you're a gardener you get to know how a plant grows and how it's acting it's having a good year yes uh, or it's you know oh it was kind of a dry spring um but yeah knowing knowing this this kind of information I feel like there's this this whole depth that uh, that I'm missing a lot of the time for sure yeah fascinating it is it is fascinating well, we've kept you uh, a while, and and I think I think most folks, a lot of folks, are 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 dropping off now. And um, I could I could uh, go all night. I would love to just keep chatting, Erica, <laughs> but we should let you go. Um, this has been uh, just fascinating, and and thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. Well, thank you so much for having me. I hope to uh, meet some of you all at some point at the Cullowee or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're ever if you're ever in Chattanooga, we'd we'd love to see you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>